Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tom Bridgman. I'm a board member here at the National, at, uh, National Capital Area Skeptics, and I'd like to welcome you to one of our public presentations. I'd like to definitely now make our announcement here. Our very special guest this week is Dr. John Mather, Senior Astrophysicist at the Observational Cosmology Group or at Laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Dr. Mather started out working uh, on the COBE proposal in the mid-1970s, joined the mission design. COBE being the cosmic... Co yeah, COBE being the cosmic microwave, ba uh, cosmic back uh, microwave background explorer and saw this, this mission through to its launch, its data gathering um, phase, and eventual identification of the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background that are one of the signatures of Big Bang cosmology. I, I thought it was particularly funny. I was in grad school at the time and taking a, ge a general relativity class, and the, one of the professors remarked that, boy, we're glad they finally saw that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Anyway, uh, so he's here to talk to us, uh, give his presentation from the Big Bang to the Nobel Prize and on to the James Webb Space Telescope and the discovery of alien life. Um, Dr. Mather won the Nobel Prize in 2006 for that work with Kobe, and uh, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Mather. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is the microphone for me also working? Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Um, so I will not answer all your questions, uh, but I like them. So uh, sometimes I just can't answer because we, nobody actually knows the answer to some of the questions that are most interesting and exciting today. But at any rate, welcome. I'm happy to talk with you. Uh, after I do my charts, we'll have a chance to answer your questions, and maybe I can. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what astronomers are doing to answer these great questions and how we're doing it, and also to try to summarize the Big Bang story for you that may not have already uh, internalized and uh, accepted the uh, implausible nature of what we actually seem to find. Uh, so let me start with uh, describing what astronomers are trying to do. Let's see if we can get the computer to go. So uh, this is what I was describing. We have a, a, uh, some understanding of how this process all works. And then, of course, we'd like to say, how is it possible that the physical conditions lead to living things? And this little mite with all its legs and whiskers is a pretty remarkable example of life also. Uh, but um, I'd, I like to say the astronomers have the easy part of this problem, because we actually have a chance to see all of the things that I'm describing, and because we can look back in time. We can see things as they were. And the biologists can't. Well, we, we have ways of estimating and thinking about the past, uh, but uh, if there was, a, for instance, another kind of life here on Earth before our kind came here, we ate it, or our ancestors <laughs> ate it. So it's not there to find, and we're not going to be able to, we're not going to get at that. So, but uh, we can, astronomers, uh, still surprise you. Uh, when you look in the mirror in the morning, you're looking at the inside of exploded stars. And this is a little bit surprising, but where, how else is this going to be? People don't usually step back and say, well, how did those atoms in front of me get here? Um, but we can tell you from the uh, story of the Big Bang that there were no carbon, oxygen, iron, sulfur atoms there in the Big Bang material. So where did they come from? They had to be made later. They were made inside stars that blew up and exploded. That's redundant. Uh, and uh, let their material out into space after nuclear reactions had processed hydrogen and helium into the other chemical elements. So we're here uh, because other stars blew up. Uh, so catastrophe is part of our history. In fact, the Earth was probably made uh, with elements that came from several tens or hundreds or even thousands of other stars that blew up, and the material got mixed together over the course of time. So uh, anyway, if, uh, if you had told Aristotle that there was a Big Bang, he would have been able to ask this question, well, if the Big Bang only had hydrogen and helium, where's the rest? And he might have been able to say, well, I don't know stuff what those little sparkly things are in the sky, but maybe they made them. You could imagine Aristotle could have done that. So uh, I mentioned that we do look back in time. As astronomers, we are the only ones who can, really. Uh, we look at things that are far away and therefore far back in time. And light travels at the uh, um, remarkable speed of, what is it, six trillion miles a year, or one foot per nanosecond. 
Uh, at any rate, if I see the end of my arm, it's as it was three nanoseconds ago. If I look all the way out to the most distant things that we could possibly see, we can almost see into the Big Bang. And when I made this chart, it was a long time ago, and we hadn't got a measurement. Uh, but we thought then it was 15 billion years ago, and so 15 billion light years out into space that you have to look. Now it's 13.7. Uh, so we got pretty close with that guess. So um, now you say, well, okay, astronomers, how do you know how far away you're looking? So this is a chart that just explains that uh, we do it the way the surveyors did it, and you've, if you took high school trigonometry or geometry, uh, this is what you would have learned in that class. We do surveying. If you can draw a triangle, and if you know one arm of the triangle and two angles of the triangle, then you know the whole shape of the triangle. So uh, that's how um, the ancient Greeks measured the size of the Earth, and they also got a pretty good estimate of the distance to the moon uh, because they figured this out. But the angles they needed to measure to measure the distance to the sun are too small, and they couldn't figure that out. They got the wrong answer. So the second method that we have is also basically a geometrical method, but it says if you look at two things and you believe that they're intrinsically the same, and one is fainter than the other, then it's because it's farther away. And this is the inverse square law uh, that we use, and uh, this is a lot harder than it looks. And the reason that it's a lot harder is the assumption that I made at the beginning, that two things are identical. Uh, they might look identical and not be. So we've been fooled a lot of times. Uh, so next thing you want to know is how fast are things moving? Well, uh, planets and uh, star, uh, planets and the moon and the asteroids and comets, they move rapidly across the sky over the course of years. And the um, name of planet actually, I think, means wanderer in ancient Greek. Um, so, uh, but what do you do for the stuff that doesn't move fast enough to, for you to notice, even with your modern equipment? Uh, the other thing you can do is tell if it's going towards you or away from uh, you by, uh, by the color of the light that we receive. This is called the Doppler shift. Uh, the picture here shows the spectra of distant stars. Uh, if you spread out the, line, the sunlight or the uh, light from a, uh, uh, a light bulb that's been passed through a gaseous material, um, there will be marks across the spectrum, and we call them spectrum lines, um, that are characteristic of the chemical elements in the gaseous material. So we get a picture of the sun that looks sort of like this with marks across it. Uh, we get uh, a spectrum of a distant star, and the spectrum is similar, except the wavelengths are all shifted in a particular way. They're all proportional. So you say, well, what would make that happen? That's because the objects coming toward us are going away from us. So we're now able to do this with astonishing precision. Uh, in some cases, we're able to measure changes of the speed of a star that are a meter per second. A meter per second, you know, going like this. And we do that. Uh, that's really handy if you want to find out if there's a planet pulling on a distant star. So this is just an introduction to planet finding is, is included in this picture, although that's not why we drew it. So now I want to tell you about the Big Bang. Uh, it was discovered in 1929. Uh, and so we, th people still are skeptical. They say, well, how can that Big Bang happen? Uh, I don't believe this story. Well, in 1929, Edwin Hubble drew this chart, and uh, I have to tell you what's on it. Um, this is a graph, and on the horizontal direction is the distance of distant galaxies. On the vertical direction is the speed. So uh, uh, this 1929, the same year that, by the way, the, uh, we discovered the economy could collapse. Uh, <laughs> in 1929, we also discovered the universe could expand. And so the, each of these dots or circles is a galaxy, and you see there's a trend here. And it's pretty well described by a straight line. So that says, OK, you can now measure the age of your universe the way that it seems to you. Divide the distance by the speed. So that was it. Got the age of the universe from that picture. Uh, now, there was a trouble at that time because Edwin Hubble was fooled. The, the way he was using to measure distance was standard candles. And he saw these little blinking lights. The, uh, they're called Cepheid variable stars that change characteristic time. And he said, I see them here, and I see them there. So over there is so much farther away than here. It just turned out that the standard candles were not the same kind in the two different places. So we were fooled. Uh, and the uh, universe appeared to be quite young, just a few billion years, because uh, this, of this error. And a little while longer, uh, a little while passed, and we began to realize that this was an implausibly young age for the universe, because we can date the, eventually we could date the Earth. We knew the Earth was older than the universe. This is a problem. Um, and later on, uh, later on, uh, we could date the uh, ages of star clusters, and uh, they were again older than the universe, and is a problem. So uh, this has been confusing for a long time. So people said, well, in that case, how about some other theory? 
So we got steady state theory and other kinds of theories that were kind of radical, even more radical than this one. Uh, so um, let me tell you some stories about the discovery and the interpretation of, the, of all these things. Uh, back in 1905, this guy, Albert Einstein, gave us the special theory of relativity and gave you the th story that there's a maximum speed of motion, gave you E equals mc squared. Um, but that wasn't the whole thing because he realized that uh, the, uh, the way gravitation works, you could actually include it into relativity, but you would have to call it the general theory of relativity. And, uh, and in that case, then uh, gravitation works by bending and warping space and time. And so uh, this was a hard thing to work on, but in 1916 he gave us these equations, which we still use and believe uh, are true. Uh, and he's, and, and then he, as, as he did that, he also thought about the universe and the expanding universe or not. Uh, all of his astronomers' friends said, oh, the universe is static. It's always been like this. Well, how did they know? They didn't know. They just thought. Uh, so um, in order to make his equations come out, uh, he had to do something to balance the attractive force of the gravitation all the galaxies pulling on each other with something that he introduced to balance it so the universe could be stable. So he had a repulsive force as well as the attractive force, and it seemed right to him. So that was 1916. In 1922, this young man, Alexander Friedman, was working in what's now uh, St. Petersburg again in uh, Russia, Petersburg, um, and he said, you know, I can apply these equations and I get a different answer. I think that that was an unstable situation and that the universe has to be expanding and that it was much denser in the beginning. And uh, that was 22. I believe he lived three more years before the plague got him, so he was a very young fellow. He didn't get to find out that he was right. Um, a few years later, it was five years later, in 1927, this young man here, uh, Georges Lemaitre, uh, another mathematician and physicist, uh, applied uh, Einstein's equations again and got the same answer, tried to get his, answers, his articles published. Einstein said it was wrong. Einstein's already famous. Uh, not only is it wrong, he says, um, uh, the equations are okay, but you're a bad physicist. No. So uh, two years after that, of course, Einstein had to apologize when the expanding universe was uh, discovered. And um, I don't know whether he was fully apologetic or not, but at any rate, uh, now we knew that the universe is indeed expanding, and these guys were right. <clears throat> so um, now a few other people that are heroes in this chart. Uh, George Gamow came to uh, the... Um, to Washington, D.C., uh, from the Ukraine. And in uh, 1948, after the World War was over, we began to know a lot more nuclear physics than we used to know. And he started to say, well, how about we figure out the conditions of this Big Bang? So they worked on the nuclear reactions that would occur. And they also calculated that it should be filled, uh, that the universe should be filled with a residual heat, uh, what's left over from the Big Bang. So these gen young men here, a uh, graduate student and a postdoctoral fellow at that time, um, they worked out this calculation. They predicted that the universe should be filled with heat radiation from the Big Bang at a temperature of about 5 degrees Kelvin, uh, which is pretty remarkably good considering how little we really knew in those days. <clears throat> so they also understood that the universe is mostly hydrogen and helium, and the, that's how the predictions come out. So uh, they were able to say, okay, this is now a testable prediction of the Big Bang theory, and they couldn't get anybody to go test it at that time. It was probably too hard. Uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, didn't know. <clears throat> um, so now I want to explain, however, a few consequences of the Big Bang idea. Uh, I've got my three astronomers here, uh, and the labels are drawn from the perspective of the one on the left here. Um, this is the expanding universe as seen by uh, our three astronomers. This one says, okay, I see the tortoise, and I see the hare, and I can divide the speed by the distance, and uh, my expanding universe started one hour ago. Okay, now imagine that you're uh, the tortoise astronomer. You look over here, you see um, this, uh, you would, this is one kilometer per hour difference from here to here. Okay, tortoise says, okay, my universe is also one hour old. We all started together one hour ago. There's no grass in outer space, so they don't know who's standing. So the conclusion from this chart is there's no center of the universe. And, uh, you know, this is really shocking. Are you, after I give my talk, almost every time, somebody says, where was it? <laughs> well, there wasn't a center, as far as we can tell. We have been looking, and there is still no sign that there's any place in the sky that's really significantly different from any other to say that that's the beginning or the center of anything. And that's because we're on the inside. 
You cannot look at the universe from the outside. And that means I cannot draw you a picture. This is my best picture of the exploding universe. Um, so I'm sorry. But we need to be beings in, say, 5, 10, 11 dimensional space to be able to stand outside the universe and look at it and say it was over there. So, but we're inside. We can't do that. So now I think people would say, well, okay, maybe I believe this wild story about the Big Bang, but how did we get here? Uh, there are no people in the Big Bang. There's no even uh, chemical elements. So what happened? Uh, well, the story that we have is that some parts of the universe have to have been a little more dense than average so that the gravitational force acting on more condensed regions will stop the expansion, turn it around, enable a cloud of gaseous material to come back together and form a galaxy. So that's prediction number one, uh, that there has to be this. Um, and, uh, and it's okay if this, if this works. Gravitational force is actually able to stop an expanding gas cloud and make a galaxy stars in it. Um, <clears throat> then after the star is formed, then of course it can burn nuclear fuel, produce the chemical elements we described, and then uh, propel and support life here on Earth. So this is, by the way, an example of how the universe does not uh, always behave like you think. Um, everybody knows that entropy increases, that order, dis order, in decre that order uh, goes away, that uh, the universe spontaneously will get uniform. This is not quite right. The reason is gravitation. Gravitation does not quite work that way. Uh, so that's a long story. But I just wanted to say that it's because gravitation attracts everything to everything that the, it's unstable and it wants to form structures. So here's a short version of the history of the universe. Uh, we've got a picture of the inside of the Big Bang. As seen from here, uh, we have an idea that galaxies form from glass clouds merging together, uh, pulling on each other with gravitational force, uh, and that from within that, <laughs> galaxies are formed. Anyway, this is our nearest neighbor galaxy. It's called M31. It's in Andromeda. It has two little satellite galaxies here and here that are in the process of being swallowed up. They will fall in in a little while. So now the text that gets people's attention. Uh, a few years back, uh, Sky and Telescope magazine said they wanted a competition to rename the Big Bang because they didn't like that name. Um, and so uh, after the end, uh, nobody was chosen to have a better name. But this was one of the uh, names that was produced by uh, and uh, published in the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon strip. <laughs> And I've actually been given the original copy of the cartoon, signed by the author. So um, anyway, the horrendous space kablooey. And uh, one of the important reasons for calling it something like that instead of Big Bang is it doesn't imply to so many people that there's a firecracker going off. This suggests maybe we should think about all of space as actually expanding. Well, we don't know what space is, so how can it expand? But at any rate, it's, uh, it's different words, and it makes people feel and think differently. So you wouldn't, if you heard horrendous space kablooey, you wouldn't necessarily say, where was it? <laughs> so at any rate, uh, it produced whatever the initial conditions are, including all the dots on this map, the antimatter, dark matter, dark energy, all the things that we now claim to know. And we now even have a quite precise measurement. It's 13.75 billion years ago. So in the first moments, then the antimatter was annihilated. A tiny bit of matter was left over, um, and that's us. The helium nuclei were formed by neutrons hitting protons, and that took about three minutes. Um, and the universe was very hot then. Then the, expand, the universe continued to expand. The gaseous material cooled down and got to a low enough temperature that the electrons could find the atomic nuclei. This is a very important moment for us because a, uh, the loose electrons will actually bounce off of uh, light waves, and a light wave cannot go very far in the early universe. It'll stop and bounce. So the un early universe is opaque. After the electrons latch onto the nuclei, then it's more like air. And air is transparent. And so the heat radiation from that moment actually flies almost unimpeded from that moment until now. And so we see the universe as it was when it suddenly became neutral gas. And the temperature was about 3,000 degrees. But the age was only a little under 400,000 years. The universe is very young at that point. Then we speculate, now this is something we don't know yet, that some early generation of massive stars uh, occurred shortly later, a couple of hundred million years later. This is a thing to be found out, whether it's true or not. Galaxies continued to form. And then, uh, curiously enough, about five billion years ago, 
and we're pretty sure of this now, the universe began to accelerate. So now it turns out maybe Einstein wasn't so wrong after all, because the acceleration force that we're now seeing is behaving just like the constant that he added to his equations to, uh, to make the universe what he thought stable. So the anti-gravity that he put in may still be real, just uh, acting differently than what he thought. So that's poss part of our possible story. Now I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Earth because it's very interesting and it's sort of personal to us. Um, so um, how did, and this is not my personal area of research, but I just think it's really cool. So we do know that the Sun and the Earth and the first solid bodies of the solar system formed 4.567 billion years ago. How would you get such a precise answer? It's from radioisotopes. Uh, and uh, the method for doing that's not so complicated as all that, but of course requires pretty careful measurement. Then, um, okay, well, what formed in the early times, we're not 100% sure, but the planets and the small bodies, uh, and apparently uh, sometime maybe uh, tens or 100 million years of, after the formation, this uh, hypothetical object, which they've been calling Thea, um, about the size of Mars, came crashing into Earth. And this uh, collision would have been enough to produce the moon. And so that's a story of how the early Earth and moon could be formed. Now, we're unique in the early inner solar system. We're the only planet with a whopping big moon like this. And so it probably is essential for our history that it's there. Um, no, no Thea, no, no life that could be. Uh, but it was another catastrophe, I'm sure, if, if anybody had been watching. Um, so we don't really know what the early Earth was like, uh, but we do know um, that uh, from the records of craters on the Moon and on Mars that the early solar system had a big event. Uh, several hundred million years after this uh, event, uh, after the formation, and rocks came flying every place. And we call it, the geologists call it the Hadean uh, geological period because it was pretty nasty. Uh, from the perspective of living things, if there had been any. Uh, when that was all over, uh, then life appears to have formed. About 3.8 billion years ago, as we see some, from some fossils. Now, this is not 100% sure, uh, but I, I think it's possible. I, my personal guess would be as soon as the conditions can occur, there will be some form of life. Uh, at the, if the temperature and, and water are there, you could have life. But then, uh, then how we got here from there is a harder problem. Uh, now, uh, suppose we think about, uh, well, I want to show you this event. Um, this is a simulation of the early solar system. What we have in the middle are the orbits of the four giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And out here are the little green rocks. These are leftovers from the initial formation. And what is simulated in this calculation is that the orbits of the planets can become unstable and actually uh, change rather dramatically. So you'll see it slow down here, and the uh, orbits will switch around. And suddenly you'll see the little green rocks go flying every which way. <laughs> and so this is the possible thing that might have suddenly dumped a lot of rocks on Earth. Comets, asteroids, who knows what, uh, may have brought the water that we currently have on the surface, uh, might have fallen on the Earth at that time. So. This is guessing, but it's a plausible guess. Uh, I guess everybody also knows that the continents float around and move on the surface of the Earth, and we seem to be the only ones in the solar system that have this kind of arrangement. Um, and people worry a lot about uh, climate change, as we should. Um, but on the, on the uh, geological time frame, we've had climate change a lot. Uh, it just takes a long time. We've had volcanic activity, uh, poison gases coming out into the, sol into the atmosphere, we had several versions of giant continents, supercontinents. The most recent one, uh, Pangaea, broke up uh, 250 million years ago. The Atlantic Ocean began to open up about 100 million years ago. And this is an interesting story of uh, scientific sociology because the Wegener who figured this out was not accepted. He was not understood or believed. He was, had his credentials in the wrong subject. He was a meteorologist, I think. But at any rate, uh, eventually scientists believed him. But even Ben Franklin knew that the continents fit together if you shoved them around on the map. And my high school teacher, my grade school history teacher said, everybody can see this. Isn't it obvious? And it wasn't to us. It wasn't to the scientists. They couldn't see how it could happen. So that's just interesting. Uh, there have been a lot of ice ages also, um, not just the recent one. 
There have been uh, several eras. Uh, there was one here about two and a half billion years ago. The, there was another one, the Cryogenian. That sounds cold, doesn't it? Um, and there's a possibility that the entire oceans may have frozen solid to the bottom, or mostly all the way. So um, there's a lot we don't know about this, but there's evidence. Uh, then uh, a little while after that, then uh, volcanism apparently let carbon dioxide out, uh, and the Cambrian explosion of life occurred. This is when fossils, uh, trilobites, and things turned up. So then a lot more. There's another ice age after that. Then the, the warm, moist age, the coal age. Um, then there was another heat event. Uh, an awful lot of uh, life got wiped out by the temperature and uh, retreated to Antarctica, what was left. So then I guess everybody's heard of the great dinosaur extinction, and if you saw the movie Deep Impact, you think, well, could, could it happen to us? Well, not right away, probably, but we have to find out. Uh, then recently, uh, the, uh, the uh, anthropologists are telling us possibly that human beings like us actually were walking around in southern Africa 150,000 years ago when there was an ice age on. Uh, and uh, then the sea level rose and uh, the water covered up the traces. So that might have been true. At any rate, uh, lots to think about on the long term there. And in the future, uh, the lot we are not going to know, know about either. Um, Galileo's telescope, we celebrated his, uh, his discoveries uh, 401 years ago, uh, last year. Um, Somehow, when I go places, kids ask me about 2012, are you sure nothing's going to happen? And I say, well, no, I'm actually going to keep on working. I'm not selling my house. <laughs> not anyway. Uh, but there are some wild uh, things that may happen. Uh, pretty clear that uh, fossil fuels are finite, and so whatever happens when they're over, it's going to be different from now. Um, and so uh, scientists are having a problem getting believed. Well, Cassandra <coughs> knew what was going to happen. Uh, Theresius knew what was going to happen, and they couldn't get anybody to believe them either. And the uh, ancient Greeks recognized the curse of uh, knowing what would happen and not getting believed. Uh, there are some wild futures. That we're quite worried about near-term heat, uh, but it's a possibility, and this is logically possible, that uh, biological activity, which makes limestone, could actually extract the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, put it back in the ground, and it would suddenly get awfully cold here. Um, then finally, the sun will get brighter. It'll get too hot for us no matter what. Uh, in about five billion years, the sun becomes a red giant about the size of the Earth's orbit. That's going to be pretty dangerous for us. Uh, and whether or not we invent space travel, it's going to be a problem. Um, then we're about halfway through the life of the sun, so at some point it goes out. The uh, long term, the universe continues to accelerate outwards. It gets emptier and emptier. Uh, a future astronomer would say, I don't know how this all got here because this is all there is. It would only be able to see the Milky Way galaxy, and uh, most of the stars would have gone out. So that would be a puzzle then. So now I want to talk about um, the Cosmic Background Explorer and the uh, science that went into that. Uh, in uh, 1974, I had just gotten out of graduate school, uh, NASA was looking for proposals for new satellite missions. It was five years after the moon landing. I said to my boss, um, well, my thesis experiment didn't work out very well, but what if we could have done it in outer space? And so he said, yes, uh, we should do that and see if we can propose this. And uh, remarkably enough, uh, we kept on winning the competitions, which not, was not what I expected. Um, <laughs> but anyway, here is the spacecraft that eventually flew. It was launched 15 years later, operated for four plus years, uh, and made amazing measurements. Yeah, there are instruments here to measure the microwave background from the Big Bang and uh, to also look for infrared light f that might have come from the most distant galaxies. So this went up, um, let's see, um, 21 years and two days ago. It was a uh, re really quite remarkable thing to witness the launch and realize that the life work of many hundreds of people was standing on a pile of hundreds of thousands of pounds of explosive material. Um, but it went up and it worked. And uh, a few weeks later, we were able to give out our first scientific result. This is a very famous chart. Um, this is uh, the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the primeval heat. We've got, it says, we didn't actually use a prism, uh, but it's as though you could spread out the sunlight with a prism and see how bright is every color. So this is what this is. The theoretical prediction of the Big Bang Theory is the smooth curve. And you see every data point lies right on it. When I showed this to the Astronomical Society, we got a standing ovation. 
And uh, from what I hear, it's the only one that's ever happened practically <laughs> uh, for a scientific result. So um, what it means is basically the Big Bang is a safe theory. Despite uh, very many difficulties and contradictory measurements and uh, some bad measurements, some bad theories to explain some bad measurements, uh, it came out OK. So people were very relieved. Uh, and now we know that the error bars are extremely tiny. They're 50 parts per million on this chart, which means this is the most precise measurement of this sort ever done. And the Big Bang still explains it. So that was cool. A um, couple of years later, uh, we published these, this uh, cover of Physics Today magazine. And Stephen Hawking said this one is the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. Uh, I thought, well, that's very nice, but it's probably not quite true. Um, but what it is, this is, I'll focus on this one. This is the map of the cosmos. This is the map of the inside of the Big Bang, as seen from here. So this is taking the entire sky uh, all around us. It looks spherical to us, but flatten it out onto a map, as you would the map of the Earth. And these are hot and cold spots of the Big Bang. So uh, it turns out these are the, also the uh, less dense or more dense regions of the Big Bang material. So uh, the more dense ones are the darker ones, it turns out, the aqua colored. Those are going to turn out to be, eventually, they'll grow up into clouds of galaxies. And the pink regions are going to grow up to be empty, no galaxies. So the, this is now um, the reason that we think we understand how we, come we can exist. Uh, that This is the process that the, the Big Bang did in order to have us be here. Of course, it, wasn't, it didn't know it was making us. But, um, other people have different opinions about the meaning of these things. But nevertheless, this is one of the reasons that so many uh, people have been so excited about this result. Uh, we wouldn't exist if it were not for those spots. So uh, there's a lot to say about that. Uh, there have been more scientific papers written about this, this map and its successors than there are spots on the map. So uh, it took uh, another few years uh, to get to the Nobel Prize. Uh, and this is what the uh, Swedish Academy of Sciences said uh, for our discovery of the black body form. And that's the spectrum with uh, boxes on this curve. And the anisotropy, and that's Greek, and it means not the same in every direction. So that means the spot, the universe has pimples. So um, we got to go to Stockholm. I showed my chart a lot of times. Um, I got to get my diploma from the king. And eventually, a nice little check, which uh, my wife and I are, have put into a uh, foundation for science and the arts. So however, there's more to come. Uh, there's a lot of mysterious uh, stuff in the sky. And so I love this cartoon from the I didn't even have to write the caption. It came out like this in The New Yorker. So uh, everything is wrong, of course, from time to time. It's one of the great pleasures of science, is you get a wonderful surprise. The public doesn't seem to understand how often this happens <laughs> and why science is so much fun for us or possibly important for them. But anyway, um, here's one of the surprises. This is the uh, acceleration that I mentioned. Uh, what the Five billion years ago, this universe starts going faster and faster. This is from 1998, I think. Uh, here's Einstein's universe expanding. Here are three gentlemen, quite young looking, who are receiving the Shaw Prize in, uh, in Hong Kong, which is called the Asian Nobel Prize. So um, they're getting their prize for discovering this acceleration. Uh, most of them that had been working on this had been measuring supernovae, and they were expecting to discover that they were going to measure the density of the universe because the universe is slowing down because of the gravitational force. They were really surprised when this turned out to not be true. And it's a pretty substantial effect. The distant stars are 20% too faint. And now that's a big effect. So now I want to talk about the coming telescope and the mysteries that astronomers face and why we're going to build a new telescope the way we are. A um, few big mysteries. Uh, what about the antimatter? Where is it? Why are there no antimatter galaxies? Um, what is the dark matter? I didn't tell you about dark matter, but most of the spots on that microwave map are due to something called dark matter. It's a uh, material which we astronomers are sure exists. It has gravitational force but it doesn't do anything else that we know of. It has gravitational force. It distorts the light beams as they go past galaxies. It makes the Milky Way not orbit the same way that we thought it would. Uh, it means the typical objects are many times more massive than they should be if you count up all the stuff that's in them. So this is a tremendous mystery, and we astronomers are the only ones to know so far. 
people believe and hope that the Hadron Collider will be able to f make some dark matter. And uh, so far, not yet. The dark energy, what is this stuff that makes the universe accelerate? It might yet not even be a stuff. Um, the name, giving it a name is already more than we really know about that. Uh, so we shouldn't do that. Everybody wants to know, how about Einstein? Is he really right? Uh, and he's awfully good, but not necessarily complete. So uh, how did we get here? This is our personal history. Uh, that's one of the, think, the reasons that so many people love science and cosmology, because they begin to tell us about this. And of course, then a very interesting question, where are the others? Are we alone? And uh, we're working pretty well on that. So um, now I want to show you the uh, reasons for building a telescope that's different from what we've had before. Um, we uh, study with the Hubble telescope, we study visible light and a little bit of ultraviolet and a little bit of infrared. Um, but the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is actually transparent for visible light, so you can even do some of this work from the ground, and we do. Uh, this graph shows you that uh, most radiation from the universe does not come through the atmosphere, so we need to build a telescope and in space. And in particular, infrared does not come through the atmosphere very well. Uh, if it did, we wouldn't be warm enough. Uh, greenhouse gases wouldn't be working. And so, uh, anyway, you can't see through the atmosphere very well with infrared. Uh, but it tells us interesting things. People look different with infrared light uh, because basically this is come, it represents the temperature of the objects. So um, we can feel it, we can't see it. And so and what it means is there's this huge uh, scientific opportunity if we can get the technology together to, um, to observe new things in the distant universe. So I'll show you the telescope and uh, what we hope to see with it. Uh, this is the telescope as it's drawn by the artists, uh, and it lo looks more like a uh, solar energy concentrator in outer space. So it is. It's a uh, galaxy energy concentrator. Light comes from over here, bounces off the parabolic mirror made out of pieces, focuses in on a smaller mirror, and bounces into the instrument package there. So uh, this is the sort of quick summary of how it works. Um, uh, tell you a little bit about the project. Uh, NASA is leading the project. It's an international partnership with Europe and Canada. Uh, the place where I work in Greenbelt is the lead organization uh, for it, and we have our prime contractor at Northrop Grumman uh, near LA Airport. So the telescope will have four instruments to take pictures and make spectra, and, uh, and will be operated like the Hubble telescope from Baltimore at the institute up there. Now, a few words about this. This is enormous. This is uh, six and a half meters, or about 21 feet across, which is a lot bigger than the rocket. And that's not even counting this sun shield, which is as big as a tennis court. So uh, the sun and the earth are down here. I'll show you how we do that. Uh, and so they do not warm up the telescope. Telescope will be cold, down to about 40 degrees Kelvin, which is to say really cold. Um, and uh, let's see. So it's cold. That, that enables us to do the infrared astronomy that we want, because a telescope doesn't glow. Here's the orbit we send it to. Um, this is uh, an exaggerated version, but there's the sun, there's the Earth, and there are five points called Lagrange points uh, where the sun and Earth gravity combine to help or make the object go around the sun once a year. So um, we choose this one, you know, it's Lagrange point number two. It's a little farther from the sun than we are, but the Earth is helping. So it keeps the, the payload uh, going around the sun with us. So this is actually about a million miles from there to there, and we're outside the orbit of the moon. Uh, and this is just a good place to be. It's the, because we can always see the telescope, always talk to it. It's not very far away, uh, and we can get all the commands and the data. So how, now I'll show you what it looked like on the National Mall. Here's a, uh, a steel model of the telescope. A uh, little different from the real one, but gives you some sense of scale. It's enormous. Um, here it is over in Germany at the Science Museum in Munich uh, in front of the old observatory dome, and I think it's a really wonderful uh, uh, sort of contrast. Uh, and, and people come from everywhere to see the telescope and just appreciate astronomy, and it's a great thing. The company made the model, by the way, because they want to sell more telescopes to other government agencies, among other things. Uh, people have other uses for this technology. We had to develop some uh, pretty uh, surprising technologies for this telescope, and so these are basically inventions which we had to complete before we could uh, learn how to do this. Uh, one is that we had to make the mirrors. They're made out of beryllium, um, 
Element number four, uh, we had to learn how to polish them so they will be the right shape when they're cold. Uh, we had to learn from the Hubble telescope how to focus. If you remember, we didn't have a good time with that for a while. Um, anyway, we learned the math from the Hubble telescope, and now we use it as this central control system for the telescope mirrors. Because we launched this thing, these are, these are folded up. It's not like that when it's launched. And each of these uh, 18 pieces has motors on it to adjust it to the right place and curvature. So now we can tell if it's focused, and we can actually control it. So that's what enables this huge increase in diameter over the Hubble. Um, and we had to do uh, other things that are also new uh, detectors and mic micro stuff. So I just want to show you a picture of the test bed telescope uh, that we use to practice. This is the telescope to practice focusing. And so we, we did it. It uh, actually works quite well. And we learned a few things that you never would have observed, never have, would have learned from a computer simulation. We have uh, four instruments that are going up. They're actually coming along quite well. These are engineering drawings, uh, but uh, the real things are going to be arriving at Goddard next summer. So uh, I'm not going to tell you how they work, but they're just uh, uh, wonderful achievements of uh, international partners as well as ourselves. Here is the test chamber down in Houston where we're going to put the telescope in and get it cold. This is what they could not do for the Hubble telescope. They could not focus the telescope on a target. Uh, before launch, um, they ran out of money and they said it was too expensive. Um, well, we're actually in danger of that too. And if you read the uh, news, you'll see uh, Senator Mikulski has chastised NASA for uh, uh, costing too much on this subject. But at any rate, I hope you'll use your uh, uh, political influence, whatever it might be, to help us with this. Anyway, here's the telescope looking up, up at the, at the uh, test equipment up here at the top. This happens to be the same test chamber that was used for rehearsing for the Apollo. And it's actually uh, called Chamber A, and it's on the historic register. So when you want to change it and put uh, cooling stuff in it, you have to go through a little documentation. <laughs> cool, huh? Now, a few examples of things people were anticipating to see in the sky. Um, one thing that we didn't know would be possible, and at, the, at least at the beginning, of, is that nature has given us additional telescope lenses to use out there in the sky. Now, uh, when Einstein said gravitation can bend light, so sure enough, if you have enough gravitation due to this huge cloud of galaxies, they can actually focus the light. Not very neatly, but they can focus the light. So here is another galaxy that's way, way, way farther, and its light has been focused and distorted but made bigger. So here is this uh, very far away galaxy made much larger. It's about 30 times magnification. So that's a big help. So there are a few things that just happen to be lined up perfectly so you can do this. Um, that's very interesting for us. I um, want to show you also about colliding galaxies. Um, we think that Milky Way and the other galaxies have been changed through time by collisions, as this simulated movie is doing. Galaxies come close together. There's a picture there that just happens to match the two real ones in the sky. Uh, and then you see they're going to continue to orbit and merge. And now you have a new galaxy of a completely different shape. This may be what happened to our own Milky Way. And we can tell, not only from computers, but also for looking for distant examples that might resemble our own galaxy. We will be looking for supernovae that are a little bit like the ones that blew up in the earliest universe. We think the first stars were much more massive than the sun, hundreds of times as massive, and that it is possible that uh, some of them will immediately produce a black hole when they blow up. Uh, very recently, uh, one uh, sort of like that was found nearby, and it turned out to be much different and much brighter than all the others. So we're still getting surprises, but we hope that there are some sort of like this in the early universe. We once in a while get an, a star blowing up and sending a jet of material out, uh, sometimes it aims at us. So this is a supernova in the artist's idea, sending uh, material almost the speed of light. And if you happen to be in the direction that it's pointed, you can see this across the edge of the universe, across billions and billions of light years. So um, not only is this interesting in its own way, uh, but it also gives us a beacon and a searchlight to understand the most early things in the universe. By the way, these were found by um, a satellite network that was put up to see if the Soviet Union was test cheating on the test ban treaty. You know, uh, we're still fussing about the test ban treaty. 
but this is one of the remarkable accomplishments of science that came from that. Uh, the, the network of satellites said somebody's cheating all the time. These things are going off quite often. Uh, and uh, astronomers were completely shocked. We couldn't understand this. Nobody knew what it was. Uh, and some people said, well, they're coming equally from every direction, so they must be coming from the distant universe. But that's a very spectacular prediction because for a, for a moment, each of those objects is as bright as all the other stars in the sky. And so how can this be that something that far away could be that bright? Well, it just happens when the thing is aimed at us. That's what does it. So a lot of wonderful surprises. Uh, closer to home, we want to see how stars like ours are made. This is one of our most famous pictures from NASA. It's called the Eagle Nebula, and it's a place where stars like that one and that one behind there have just been born. So um, you'd like to say, well, I think they're being born inside those dust clouds, but I can't see inside. This dust, by the way, is also those same chemical elements that were made inside previous generations of stars. So what are we going to do to see how stars are born inside this cloud? Try using infrared. And this is the same place. Uh, and you can see it's very different. The uh, dust is not nearly as opaque. Uh, and you can begin to see things that are inside the dust cloud that you couldn't have seen before. So these are newly born stars. Now, uh, this is not necessarily where they're happening now. Uh, but other places like this, we can see inside with infrared. We can see planets, even. Um, a few have been seen and actually had their pictures taken around other stars. The one I like the best is this one. Uh, this one was uh, around a very bright star in the southern sky. And these are Hubble pictures. Uh, what the Hubble did was first they said there's a star over here. We're going to block that out. We'll blot that out with a, a thing where you just don't let the light in. And this is called a coronagraph. And then you see this dust ring orbiting around it. They looked at that and they said that ring couldn't be like that unless something was making it like that. So there must be a planet whose gravitational force is causing that shape. And so sure enough, uh, when they looked carefully, they came back a couple of years later, the planet was there and then it moved. So uh, this is the first time since the discovery of Neptune that people said mathematically, we know it's got to be there and it was there. It's very cool. Uh, we've also begun to learn how to take pictures from the ground. Um, that's a Hubble telescope picture, but these others are taken from the ground with uh, very fancy optics, and they're making progress too. Now, here's a quite remarkable process that we now can do. Uh, once in a while, a planet goes in front of a star, blocks some of the light, then it, goes, then it comes back up. Now, while this is happening, some of the starlight is actually going through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to our telescope. So that means we can begin to learn about the characteristics of those planets and their atmospheres and get the chemistry, the temperature. Um, if you're really lucky, we hope to even be able to see the presence of moons around other planets. Sometimes the planet goes behind the star. And if the planet is really bright, then you can notice this too, but only for very hot planets. Uh, but we got some of those already. We have a catalog now of about uh, 500 of these objects. Uh, most of them have been observed by what's called the Kepler telescope, which is put up just exactly to find these objects. And when they get done in a few years, they hope to tell us, here's a list of stars like the sun with planets like the Earth. We'll see. Hope th I hope they're successful. Um, the search for life. Well, clearly, one way is to study these objects. See if you can si find the signs of uh, what we take as sign of life here, oxygen. Oxygen is in our atmosphere. It's there because plants made it. So if you can find oxygen in the atmosphere of another star, and then along with things like carbon dioxide and water vapor, you say, oh, that's an awful lot like Earth. Um, if you want to know, uh, is there others, some other kind of life that doesn't work like ours, we might never know. Uh, but at least this kind, our kind, could be detected from tremendous distances because of that specialness of oxygen. So um, there is really a hope. If you uh, want to look for life in the solar system, there are also places to go. Um, there are f everybody knows about Earth and Mars. How about other places? There are f four satellites of the giant planets that are already known to have water, liquid water. So here's one of them. Uh, this is Europa. It's the satellite of Jupiter. Galileo saw it. He didn't see these cracks. Uh, what this is is a surface uh, covered with ice, and there's these, uh, and it's a very active little moon. 
the, and the, so the, we believe that there's uh, liquid water underneath, probably pretty salty, uh, and that these uh, cracks are in the surface are letting mud or whatever is coming up from the bottom up to the surface. So you could say, well, how do I know what's there? Well, we might just want to go land sometime and drill a hole. Uh, you would, anyway, a very interesting place to go. It's one of the reasons that this is one of the top targets for outer solar system exploration. Um, so let's see, uh, there's a lot more to tell you. Uh, if you want to hear this or see the story of the Kobe project and uh, some of what we're doing now, there is a book, uh, I guess all the copies that I brought have been snapped up. Um, you can get them from Amazon uh, for pretty cheap or uh, uh, in the first edition you can on, get on Kindle also. So uh, lots of possibilities, but I'm very happy to uh, have questions about anything. and. Uh, so thank you for coming. Okay, I see hands every place. Let me start in the back. When, when is the expected launch of this? Oh, well, the official launch date's 2014, but we can't make it because we don't have enough money right now budgeted. And so we have been... Um, examined very carefully by the review committees that are telling us we need more money. And, uh, okay. So call your representative. Yeah, it would be a nice idea. Okay, over there. Uh, the uh, concept, uh, I, I see that some of this stuff started by adding more terms to Maxwell's equations. And uh, is there a, a path that you got from that uh, animation of how Earth forms that goes back to Maxwell's equations? Uh, or to the, what kind of equations generated that picture? of uh, the three big, of how Earth formed out of the universe in the early thing, that, that animation. Ah, well, they, oh, the animation that I showed you about the solar system, yeah. uh, that's just gravitation. That's gravitation. Just ordinary gravity. Uh, when Newton told us about the laws of gravity, people looked up in the sky and said, perfect clock, clockwork universe. Um, people didn't know at that time that uh, gravitation doesn't make a clockwork universe because the gravitational forces are unstable. Uh, and it's, it's actually now hard to explain how come the solar system has been stable for more or less five billion years. For, because um, it's very easy. F if you start off with a hypothetical solar system, most of them don't end up like the current solar system. So that's interesting and difficult, tricky question. Here we go. You said that the universe uh, expansion started to accelerate about five billion years ago. That's right around when our solar system was coming That's a coincidence? I suppose. How interesting. Yeah. It, it was going to happen sometime. <laughs> um, I hope this isn't uh, too far out, but uh, the, what sort of evidence would astronomers uh, have to find to support the sort of multiverse hypothesis? Oh, the multiverse. Um, at the moment, I'm not aware that there's any testable prediction from the multiverse hypothesis. So it's probable that we astronomers would not be able to see anything that would tell, <coughs> test that theory. On the other hand, um, sometimes theories uh, do predict, predict something you can see, and they just haven't gotten far enough yet. Um, mathematicians did predict things that turned out. They predicted dark, they predicted antimatter. Dirac's equations had a place for antimatter. That was quite a surprise. And then it was found. And uh, Einstein gave us this possibility of the dark energy. And we thought, oh, that's crazy. But there it is, I guess. So anyway, um, the multiverse is probably going to be in this category of almost untestable, but sometime we might have a theory that we really like. Right now, we don't have a theory of quantum gravity. Uh, we don't know how gravity seems to work. And it's up for grabs at the moment. So when they get there, maybe we'll believe it. In the same uh, realm, perhaps, uh, as I understand it, the string theorists argue that there are 11 dimensions, or is it 13? Um, tell us about it. Oh, well, OK, string theory and uh, the number of dimensions. Um, there are a lot of different versions of string theory. Um, people wonder, what is string theory, and why do we care about stringy things? Um, that, uh, just a, a short story about string theory and why we need it, or something like it. Um, we know how to calculate the energy in the electric field of a particle. 
uh, say, a, an electron, we think of it as a point object. It's got an electric field sticking out, and we think there's energy in the electric fields. You add up all the energy that an electron should have from that, and it's infinity. So it doesn't work, right? So what you're going to do? Well, suppose the electron wasn't a point, but was actually a, a thread. Uh, maybe a very tiny thread, but then it now wouldn't be infinity anymore. So this is a way around the infinities. Richard Feynman and others got uh, prizes for thinking about how to make subtract infinity from infinity and get something reasonable. <laughs> uh, in this case, uh, maybe well, let's not put the infinity in. Maybe there's another way. So um, the string theories that people are working on are following this idea and trying to make it work, and how many dimensions do you have to have? Uh, so they're getting a lot of progress. It's just we can't tell how soon we're going to get to the end. It's not been discredited. No, it's not discredited, uh, but it's also not finished. Uh, it's a hard job. When we finally get the answer, people will say, how come we didn't think of that a long time ago? But right now, it's a mystery. Oh, so many questions. We'll take that one. Are we smart enough yet to figure out how big or huge the universe is? Oh, sort of. Um, <laughs> we know how big the observable part is. We've got the age, and we can say, well, we can see 13.75 billion light years in every direction. So it's 27.5, I guess, uh, total diameter that we can see. Uh, but that, on the other hand, we say, if you were standing out there, what would it look like? And somebody out there would say, oh, I think it's 26.7 billion light years is diameter from where they're standing. So we imagine that it's actually infinity. But we can't tell. You cannot observe infinity. Oh, uh, there. Uh, I'm, okay, you said that there uh, hasn't been any center proven of the universe. And there was a theory that uh, not only when the Big Bang happened did uh, matter go out, but also uh, space itself expanded. And so you really wouldn't have a uh, center. The center was the uh, current universe. Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to say when I said the horrendous space kablooey is a better name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly what you said. Is there anything you can say about what happened before the Big Bang? And is there anything you can say about uh, the claim is that everything is determined, that everything is sort of baked in at the time of the Big Bang, determinism. And is there anything you can say about that with regard to free will? Okay, my golly, there's two very different questions there. <laughs> uh, the first question is, uh, what's there before the Big Bang, or how did this uh, occur? And uh, a few years ago, we would have been pretty sure that the answer was the universe started with a singularity. Uh, that there was just nothing before that. Uh, now we don't think that. Uh, it's been proven that there are ways to avoid that particular extreme infinity. And so now we say, well, what if there were a, some uh, substrate universe, maybe in 11 dimensions or something, and it just has quantum mechanics or whatever the new thing will be going on, and it erupts and makes universes. So that could be. Uh, it could even be that uh, the universe that we have is one of many and uh, that ours will go out and collapse or that others are going out and collapsing again. And uh, we probably could never tell, but we might have a good story. Uh, about your other question about is, are things uh, determined from the beginning? Uh, that's also a hard story, but uh, I think uh, the question of whether we have free will is more a matter of point of view than it is uh, physics. You know. If, if I believe that every motion of every atom and molecule in my body is predetermined, it still doesn't mean that I know what it's going to do. I don't know what I'm about to say before I say it. So, um, and I, I think that's where people have run into trouble. They, thought, they think there's a scientific answer to whether there's free will. And that's really a matter of what's the definition of free will. Well, way in the back. Um, at the facility in CERN in Switzerland, uh, there were news stories a little bit about the possibility of black holes being formed and that that was a hazard. Uh, could you expand on that? Yeah. Um, the question was whether it was safe to turn on this, this particle accelerator. Would, we, would a black hole be made that could swallow the Earth? That was the sort of extreme version. Um, the scientific answer to that, which the judge believed, was that nature does this all the time. There are much more energetic particles made in the, in the sky by natural processes. Uh, and uh, if they were going to make black holes that swallowed the universe, it would have already happened. 
So the conclusion was it's safe to turn it on. And sure enough, nothing bad has happened yet except uh, blowing up magnets. <laughs> so there we go. Is there necessarily one big bang, or could there be multiple big bangs with a sort of recycling effect? Oh, um, so you're asking partly about does it go out and come back? Um, yeah, um, it could be. Um, we don't know why it's currently accelerating, so that means we also don't know why, whether to predict that it will stop accelerating and turn around. Uh, at the moment, it sort of looks like it's not going to turn around this time. But it doesn't mean that it didn't collapse from a previous thing, previous cycle beforehand. Maybe there was this cosmic crunch that came before the great expansion. Uh, and so there are th pretty sound mathematicians working on this kind of idea. And in particular, in the uh, story of mul multiple dimensions, you can say, well, what if there are two surfaces in this higher dimensional space and they sort of come together and then they go apart again? In the, the, the way they think about it, that event looks like a big bang to us in our small number of dimensions. So if they go about, well, they could move any way they like. You know, we don't know. So I think it's just possible. And again, it's going to be really hard to tell from measurement because they all come out explaining what we've already seen. Otherwise, we don't like the theory. Right, yeah. <laughs> Is this the M theory that the grand design theory? Oh, yeah, I think it's the M theory. Yeah. Is that the multiple? I, I guess I don't understand yeah. it. So. That's another way of naming this story about the strings. Okay. The things where I said a point has to be a thread or something. You could have a, instead of a thread, how about a sheet or something? Is that, is that the letter M? M, M is in yeah. membranes. Yeah. yeah. OK, in the back. Uh, I have a question about W map. You, know, you said it's about measuring about 5 degrees Kelvin. So is it cooling off over time so oh. that it wouldn't be measurable? And oh, um, what's happening to the temperature of the Big Bang radiation? Yeah. It diminishes as the universe expands. It turns out the expansion uh, size times the temperature of the radiation is a constant. So when the universe is twice as big, the temperature will be half as big. And uh, we cannot measure that. We speculate, but we cannot possibly measure that. It's too slow. On the other hand, we are able to, measure, to make remote measurements of the universe's temperature. We can, there are little molecules out there that we can see how the microwaves were acting on them. So indeed, the early universe was hotter. We can measure that. Maybe three more questions. Okay. Is that okay with you? I, I, I've heard uh, one, one thing that you, you skipped over was the period of inflation mm -hmm. shortly after the Big Bang. And what I understand is that one of the things that led to folks to think that inflation occurred is that the geometry of space is very flat. How does an, astron an astronomer measure the geometry, ah. flatness or curvature of space? Right. Uh, of course, we don't directly do it. Uh, when the curvature was uh, conceived as an explanation, people actually went out to mountains and tried to measure whether the sum of angles of a triangle was 180 degrees. Uh, and they couldn't tell uh, that it was different. So uh, we also don't do that. Uh, but what we can do is uh, uh, deduce what the properties of the universe must be to explain the, spe the speckles on the map. Um, so um, a lot of different lines of evidence say that the universe is geometrically flat. Uh, which means not that space isn't, space-time is still curved, according to Einstein. Uh, but if you take a slice of the universe, all the places that are 13.7 billion years after the explosion, that's a surface in three-dimensional space. And so if you now measure in that space, those, it is indeed flat. It's not curved. And the, the explanation we have for that is it used to be curved, but the expansion has stretched the curvature out so far that you can't see it. So if you take a small balloon, and you can see that it's curved, and then you blow it up really, really big, and you can still only see a tiny piece of it now, now you think it's flat. OK. Uh, well, you, you quoted uh, uh, Plato, uh, Aristotle and Plato. Uh, Plato's allegory of the cave says what you see depends on, its point of, on your point of view. An extension of that is the map is not the territory. Uh, uh, Taken to the case, case that you fit it all the that every observable thing fits your equations. Uh, does that uh, may does that necessarily mean that uh, uh, 
uh, that's how it is. Uh, for example, a, a quadratic equation as compared to an n-dimensional uh, 200 variable equation has two, the two solutions and you pick the one that fits your intuition. And are we maybe that M theory and string theory fit that way and, uh, and everything else fits the way I observe? But that may not be where the universe knows how it works and there may be something underlying. Is there anything that you've seen that says that that may be what's going on? Um. So you're basically asking, would we know if we'd ever found the right story? Yeah. And I think the answer is, we might guess it, but we probably can't prove it. Uh, because as you say, uh, there's probably more than one way to explain everything we've found. Uh, in fact, when inflation was first invented, I thought, well, those, just, those guys just made it up to explain what we already know. Mm -hmm. It's pretty wild. And so my fellow astronomers thought, oh, that's nuts. Mm -hmm. It turned out the... Uh, Particle physicists had plenty of reason to think that it was true no matter whether, whether the astronomers saw anything or not. So um, this, the particle people wanted that. And so Alan Guth is a very famous guy because his idea fell on receptive ears. Astronomers that had proposed similar things, nobody wanted to hear them because there were precursors. People wrote before Alan Guth did about inflation. Nobody believed it. I was wondering if you could talk about the um, supergalactic structures, the wall and the attractor. Yeah, a little bit. Um, he's asking about the, how are galaxies arranged. Uh, and uh, if you uh, just said, well, the universe is randomly filled with specks of pepper, uh, you would not see patterns. But what's been happening apparently is that gravitation acting over the course of time has pulled together galaxies into, crowd, into clouds. And in fact, uh, it's a little worse than that. Uh, it works that uh, dark matter did that first. Dark matter was able to move even before ordinary matter could move. So there are clouds of dark matter out there, and they pull ordinary matter in, and then we see the galaxies. So all of this is now possible to simulate in the supercomputers, and uh, we have amazing movies of the formation of the structures of where the galaxies actually are located. So indeed, we get these clouds of hundreds and thousands of galaxies together, and then we get empty spaces. And it sort of looks like the structure of a sponge with uh, surfaces where there's a high density of material and then big holes where there's nothing. And uh, if you had told us that was how it was uh, before the computers came along and the dark matter was invented or discovered or whatever we call it, uh, we would all have been shocked. Nobody knew how to do this because we, we were able to observe the fact that these structures exist. But we couldn't figure out how they got there until the computers came along. Thank you, thank you.